So my name is Lindsay Grace. I'll give you a little more context through the presentation. Uh, I should give you a heads up if you've never seen me speak before. Uh, I tend to speak very quickly. I'll try and slow myself down. Uh, if I say something crazy, I actually, this morning, uh, or last night at about 1 a.m., took a taxi from Detroit here because my flight got canceled. Um, so I'm also a little tired. Uh, but I think this will work out well. Uh, and this presentation in particular is kind of a conglomerate of presentations I've given in a variety of spaces like GDC and South By, etc. So um, let's get started. So I figured it's the morning, and I'd actually like to start with an experiment that you're going to participate in. If you don't feel like participating, that's fine, but I'm going to do it, and uh, it would be great if you'd like to. So the first thing I do is I'd like you to act like you're shooting the person next to you. you know, bang, bang, bang. Great. I have some great sound effects, the classic. Yeah. Um, no laser guns this time. Now make it big. Like, really go for it. Really, like, use the BMG. To, there you go. Great. Now I'd like you to fake flirt with the person next to you. <laughs> so, then you can go ahead and fake kiss the person next to you. And then I could ask you if you're comfortable doing more, but if you are, please make <laughs> So what's interesting here, and the, the reason that I'm, I'm uh, really excited about this kind of research is, it's really, um, really entertaining to see the difference between affection play and fight play for people. So I didn't see any hesitation in general with, sure, I'll shoot the person next to me, but I did see a lot of hesitation once we went flirt or kiss. So um, my current questions are really simple in this space. I want to know what happens when we digitally mediate affection play. So that was sort of an analog experience for you. What happens when we include computers in this interaction? And then also, how does digital affection juxtapose violent play? So there's been all this research over the years about violence and, and digital play in particular, and I'm curious about what could be considered its inverse. I'm not sure that affection is the inverse of violence, but we'll get to that. Uh, and then I'd also like to know how violence and affection coexist, and I absolutely love that image. <laughs> so, uh, and lastly, uh, this, this question around how does affection play in the digital space actually affect the players? So I have a pretty wide range of questions, and I'm going to bounce across a bunch of them. I've got seven or eight um, publications in this space in the last two years, so you're going to get some highlights from that in this presentation. Also interested in how affection games or affection play is constrained. So what are these digital games doing that actually is different than what people would do in the analog space, or how is it um, actually supported? So you might not think that I'm sane, so let me give you a little background of where I'm coming from. So uh, this is the usual context setting. So I've been making games since these were popular. This is the first game I made as a kid, Super Mystery House. It was awful. Um, but it wasn't a five and a quarter disc yet, and I did sell it locally. Uh, and I've been teaching games for more than uh, 11 years. I've also directed two top games programs. So I directed Miami University's Game Center uh, down in Oxford, Ohio, and I currently direct American University's Game uh, Studio. So that's the, um, that's the American University Game Lab and Studio missing an image. <laughs> uh, it's a top-ranked Princeton Review program. Uh, and I'm the board member, uh, a board member, and the academic liaison for the Global Game Jam, uh, which is a, a nonprofit I really believe in. Uh, and this is my plug. I'm also the co-chair of the uh, International Conference on Game Jams, Hackathons, and Game Creation Events, which is happening right before GDC next year. We would love you to submit your papers because there's still it's still time to do it. Uh, and uh, it's an ACM publication for those of you who get credit for proceedings and things like academic venues. So uh, I'm also an indie game designer and developer. Uh, I make a lot of games by myself uh, as uh, both a developer, designer, um, and artist. And so I guess I'm best known for critical gameplay, but I also made a bunch of iOS games uh, under my top games. And my work's been shown kind of all over the world in lots of different states. Uh, and I've published more than 50 articles, book chapters, papers, etc. within this space since 2009. Uh, I talk a lot, uh, so I'm fairly comfortable doing this sort of thing. Uh, spoken at GDC, uh, we'll be speaking again at South by Southwest this year, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I've uh, been featured in the press uh, several times, same sort of content, largely focusing on social impact games. So as I mentioned, I run the Game Lab and Studio at American University. And we actually do a lot of studio work. So um, we have more than $600,000 in game contracts since 2014. Uh, and a lot of the uh, research that I do ends up finding its way into these contracts with a variety of partners, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So if you're not familiar with this and you want to show some awesome indie games, 
Every year, uh, we run something called the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Indie Arcade, along with Git Magfest and uh, a couple of the IGDA chapters along the eastern seaboard. Short version is 11,000 people come to the Smithsonian uh, to play indie games in a single day. It's a really wonderful experience. And so I've been teaching and using games for a long time. Uh, and one of the things I do in helping people, uh, I guess a relatively long time, in helping people understand uh, play and games and its values, they sort of start, about, start telling people about play's purpose. So the fundamental question is always, why do we play? And hopefully you guys got to see Stuart Brown's uh, presentation yesterday. I'm hoping he, I wasn't here yesterday, but I'm hoping he did touch on some of this. Uh, the short, short version is that it actually has two purposes for all people and animals. And if you didn't notice, that's actually two purposes um, <laughs> to help you remember. <laughs> so play is both practice and laboratory. And if you think about it, uh, we've got lots of evidence of this, both in the anthropological and sociological texts, um, as well as the, the more modern uh, psychology. And from this, you understand that play is for experiment. So the idea is that you experiment within play. It's a great way for us to learn everything from play fighting, what works, what doesn't work, um, to understanding roles and role play, etc. So if you look at a game like Tag, you can understand Tag as being an opportunity to practice hunter and hunting. Um, two fundamental skills for the human animal. So the question here is why do we do things like um, play fight? And not only why do we do play fight, why do we do digital play fight? And what's the benefit to that? Or um, my obvious question is when we play, we seem to play with war, and why do we do that? So we do practice killing and murder. Uh, and I have this challenge where I'm sort of wondering, there's, not, there's plenty of that in the world, why would we want to practice more of it? So the question is, are we more likely to need practice with affection or violence instead? Uh, so I'd like to talk to you about affection games. First, the question is always, what is an affection game? Essentially, the way I've defined them over the last two or three years is very simple. They're games in which the player must flirt, hug, kiss, or make love, censored, um, to meet their goal. From my research, I found more than 500 of these games. And before I get into the digital games, I just want to give you a quick history about affection play itself. So if we start with attraction and the novelty and use of attraction, one of the things we've found in science is that um, people who play are attractive. Playfulness is an attractive trait. So daredevils, for example, um, like uh, uh, James Dean in the, in the Porsche, um, or a really cool Supra, make certain sort of people attractive, as does um, the flirt. So there we're up here. And it's fascinating to me that there's actually like a, a how to flirt, and it's a step by step. Um, because these are not skills that you necessarily are born with, they're actually things that you need to play and practice, which is where games become quite valuable. So the human animal itself welcomes play as a signal of desirability. And we have all these courtship rituals, which is where a lot of this original um, research came from. So let's look at dancing, for example. So, or whatever this person's doing. <laughs> there's something attractive, and there's a certain ritual to the way that we find attraction in others. And it's about this sort of dance, this balance, this reading of, um, of needs and wants and, and um, preferences. And it's also updated as our world of technology updates. Right? So the way you find a date changes from going to your local sock hop um, to uh, something like Tinder or Bumble. So this, the culture scholars came in and started analyzing this uh, in the 50s and 60s, and then they sort of revisited. So there's some really interesting texts around courting rituals. Uh, I thought this one was particularly easy and accessible uh, for people who haven't really done a lot of research in this space. And one of the things I think is really interesting is that we have some traditions, like the kissing booth in the United States, and the kissing booth becomes almost mythologized to the point that when you um, ask questions about it to an audience that never seen them firsthand, they don't quite get them. So here's a question on Reddit about whether or not kissing booths really existed. Because it becomes this myth that people don't believe there's any way anyone would actually kiss someone for five cents. Um, which brings us to my favorite piece in the space um, of scholarly work. It's Brian Sutton Smith's Kissing Games of Adolescents in Ohio. And this sort of seminal work in this space uh, included an inventory of 22 kissing games for adolescents. Anyone remember the first kissing game they ever played, if they did? 
Can I just blurt out some games you played? Yeah, see, I figured you would say that. <laughs> because by far it is the most popular, and even amongst his research it was then too. It's probably a combination of simplicity of mechanics, um, as well as uh, just the, um, the sort of playability and the fact that it's pretty portable, very popular. So in 1959, 57% of junior high school college students, uh, at, I'm sorry, junior high school and college sophomores, through college sophomores, played Spin the Bottle. Uh, they also played a couple of games I'd like to share with you if you're not familiar with them. Turtle Climb, Choo Choo, and um, some other ones that actually reflect a bit of the 1959 um, experience. So for me, the most interesting is this game called Choo Choo Variants, or Choo Choo, um, and it's all its variants. So the way this game works is uh, first player is the great player there, and then they choose someone from the group to kiss. They kiss that person, and then that person gets to choose the next person to kiss. So they chose blue, the person here, and it goes on and on, um, each kissing kind of like a kissing train, until they get to the last person. And that last person gets a slap. <laughs> and that's the game, right? It's fascinating to me how much that reveals about sort of a, um, a culture that says, you know, there's, there's, there's one out and everybody else is in. And what does that mean? Um, another one, that's interesting to me is this turtle flying game, which, you know, it's interesting in Sun Smith's research, he really explicitly says there's only, um, he only had a few occurrences of this, but in short, what happens is this is just a maneuver to kiss. Uh, basically, you tell a story, you move your hands up a person, and then um, you're demonstrating a turtle climbing, and then you go in for the kiss. So it's sort of like the movie theater beyond, where the arm comes out and you just sort of go over. But it was enough that people had a name for it and they knew it. Um, they also played things like telephone, but with kisses. Uh, and remember that one of the interesting things here is, is the age at which people are playing these games. So uh, you would be playing this game, for example, as young as six or seven. And then there's all these other accidental kiss games that are in some of the histories, the scholarly histories. Uh, so they actually categorize, for example, um, versions of bobbing for the apple uh, as, a, as an accidental kiss game. So you'd occasionally get so close to someone you'd end up kissing them. So, one of my interests is just in this idea of how these games evolved and the persistence of these specific games. So, for example, if you look at Twister, uh, Twister was originally set up as sort of an adult game. This is the image of Twister that represents its, its birth. Uh, this is a sort of party game for adults over cocktails. Uh, and then it became a sort of college craze. And it gets a little more risque here, right? You're playing it in your bathing suit. Uh, and then we know this sort of contemporary Twister. And the contemporary Twister starts going into sort of a family game, gets younger and younger, uh, and you'll see it more, it's even marketed as, as sort of a younger game. And in part, obviously, it's losing some of its, uh, hopefully, some of its the, the sexual connotations here, but it's still um, the game in Tai Chi knots. Sometimes the translation doesn't work very well, so this is Spin the Bottle, the family game, um, which I, I think someone missed the mark on that one. <laughs> And then if we fast forward, which is the space that I'm most interested in, because I'm sort of a digital guy, uh, we have this sort of digital future. And in a digital future, you have these little portable devices, I don't know what we'll call them, tricorders. Uh, and the idea is that you also have network play. So these are sort of old land pictures. Uh, and people have digital cells and second lives. And oddly enough, do you know what they do later? They continue to play spin the bottle with their second lives. Um, so this is the second live section uh, with the champagne spin the bottle. So you kind of ask immediately, in all those years, how did the technology change the kissing games themselves? And honestly, it didn't change them much. If you look it up, um, or if you look at some of the research that I published, you find out that spin the bottle is still an enormously common game in the mobile space. So there are lots of versions of spin the bottle that you can download for, particularly uh, Android phones, but uh, there are some that combine Truth or Dare with Spin the Bottle. Uh, Spin and Dare is an example of one. Um, but basically, there isn't a huge evolution in the space yet. One of the things I do think is interesting is once you have a digitally mediated um, experience like this, so this Spin the Bottle, Spin the Bottle Plus, has you holding hands with a person two to your right. And if you remember how Spin the Bottle is typically played, it's actually gender mixed. So it's boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, typically. So the game is actually giving you a different set of instructions than you may have given each other within the game. 
So that's sort of interesting, the idea of the, the digital version of the game instructing you to behave differently. So <clears throat> ultimately what we did was we largely converted the old games to facilitate the same kind of non-digital interactions. Um, now I'm going to switch over to talking a little more specifically about digital affection. So this is a scene from Bully. Um, and what I'm kind of deeming is digital affection games. So let's talk about social intimacy first. There were, in the mid-2000s, uh, a sort of rash of research publications that were really trying to ask these questions about what do we do with affection and intimacy in a digital mediated space. So this is sort of post.com boom. Everyone's sort of saying, okay, what else can we consider as part of our socialization in the space? And so you can see some things from Kai, um, the uh, large-scale human-computer interaction conference, and some others. Uh, I think this was an interesting one, basically talking about why we should be talking about sexual interactions within um, HCI, because it is there, and to ignore it claims that we are ignoring a portion of our standard interactions with computers. Uh, and then there were some solutions in this space. So the one that I found was most closely related to affection games, but not quite there, is this solution, um, Pillow Talk, which is a Kai Extended Abstract, so sort of part of the Creative Showcase. And what they were endeavoring to do is to create an LED-enhanced pillow that's facilitated intimacy. Um, so the idea is that you, you really do uh, interact with it a little more, um, a little more, uh, I don't know, intimately than you would, say, a piece of steel or plastic. So the most interesting thing after that is these alternative interfaces that are also about setting us up for play in this space. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the KISS controller, but this is probably the strongest um, movement in that alternative interface and affection space. So as you can see from uh, her headset, essentially what happens is this is a controller that only works when you kiss, and it's a shared control experience. Um, this was a Kai paper years ago, and um, what's interesting about this is I want you to, for a minute to just imagine what kind of game you would create around this interface. So the idea is you must kiss to succeed in the game. Just give yourself 10 seconds and go, oh, I wonder if it would work well with like a Super Mario platformer, or really well with, uh, I don't know, something else. 10 seconds. Got an image of a game that would make sense? Mortal Kombat. Woo! Competitive. <laughs> so they went with bowling. <laughs> Which is interesting. Um, and I'm not here to critique other work, it's more just to think about what it means to say that kissing is like bowling. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the other game that was coupled with it is uh, a kind of race car collection game. So you're sort of steering this car uh, with the movement of your tongue shared amongst two people. And I think it's interesting to say, are you more of a bowling kisser or a car racing kisser? Uh, because ultimately, there's this challenge of metaphor that we see perpetually in affection play. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with uh, not only cultural translation, but the physical translation. There are very, it's very hard to discuss um, certain topics within this space because they are so ephemeral for us. So often what you find is that virtual affection and real affection are not that well married. So I can talk about my own work in this context because this is sort of where I originally started. So this is my game Big Huggin uh, that I made several years ago. In short, the way the game works, is, this, this is it being shown in Paris, is that big teddy bear is your controller. You give him uh, about 12 degrees of hugs, so he can support 12 different types of hugs, big hugs, little hugs. Uh, and then it's a platformer, and every time you hug him, you're actually hugging him past his obstacles. So there'll be a boulder, there'll be a river, whatever, there'll be something that's too high. And so you've got to mitigate these just right. If you hug him too much, then you lose control. If you um, under-hug him, then he doesn't get past his obstacle. And so there's uh, just screenshots from it, hopping over boulders and a stream. Uh, as the game progresses, uh, there's nine levels total, so these are levels three through six. You actually have, I'm not a big fan of snow, so it's like just getting through the snow is really hard. Uh, and then ultimately you get the really scary part. Uh, and this game obviously appeals to children, but I actually try to create it at dimensions that would matter to an adult. So this is a 36 inch bear, uh, so we should feel the way a, um, I don't know, a seven or eight year old would be hugging their teddy bear, uh, but as an adult, because the proportion should be pretty close. Um, and then 
the thing that I really sort of I was really interested at this point was this idea of kind of finding an object of affection. So the motivation behind uh, Big Hugging is partly this idea that we um, we love this thing, and so we're giving it this great big hug, and it becomes the object of affection, and it's the controller. Um, but in other spaces, like fight play, we're very comfortable with it. So we've got the NES Zapper. Um, we've got all these sort of fake guns, and they're very obvious, and we're very used to them, uh, and they're not very hard. But on the hug side, we tend to depend on a pillow. So um, there's uh, one or two other projects. Um, one project basically has two players hugging a pillow with a, um, with a move controller in the middle of it. So they've got to steer the space together in order to make the um, move controller actually respond to them. Uh, and then on kisses, it starts to get a little more awkward. Like, what is the object in which you interact with? Uh, because uh, fakes and lips is just not going to quite feel the same. Uh, and then it can get really awkward, but we're just going to move on. <laughs> so the physical world of affection games is actually really quite difficult. Uh, and one of the critiques that I'd often get from Big Huggin', for example, is, well, you need the bear to hug you back. But if you've ever hugged a semi-robotic thing, that just doesn't quite feel as good. Uh, and I actually liked that it was this durable, simple thing where you could give all the love, but it didn't necessarily give the love back. Okay. Um, the other thing is, honestly, uh, it can get kind of germy. Um, intimacy is not always uh, as sterile as some of the other play. So, for example, uh, when Big Hugging was being shown at some venues, there were 500 plus people hugging it a day. Uh, and that, while I loved it being a furry experience, because you rarely get something that's furry in the um, game space, it also creates its own complications. So let's move to mobile and web affection games, which is the um, sort of the latest phase of this research. So by my estimates, 2,500 people kiss their smartphones every day. And the way I came up with that uh, is that there is a bunch of games that actually explicitly tell you that you must take the phone and press it against your lips, or press your lips against the phone. And if you look at the number of downloads per day for those games, it's at least 5,000. So I'm guessing about 50% of the people actually bother to press their lips to it at least once, but that's a really novel um, idea. Uh, so, like I said, there's at least 500 affection games, and they all ask their players to hug, kiss, or flirt. Here's some very specific data from an early Digger paper that I did on, um, on web affection games, and you can see a couple of patterns here. You can see that by far, the big green, kissing is the most popular of the genre. So of those game verbs, kissing is most common. And then you can also see that there's sort of a gender bias, which I've written about several times, about the kinds of places that certain types of play are offered, um, which kind of confirms some things we know about um, the sociology of gender. And then more recently, uh, I published in um, the Social Casual Mobile Games book, uh, this little table amongst others, that explicitly de demonstrates which verbs are happening where, uh, so one of the things that's interesting I'll talk about in a minute is that Google Play actually has far more affection games uh, than Apple, and Apple generally doesn't support them. So <clears throat> these affection games look like this. You're probably wondering what do these things look like. Um, and the idea here, for example, is that we've got some um, cultural tropes being translated. So the angel, classic sort of female role, and the devil, the male, have to kiss, and you cannot let that Cupid angel see them kiss. So when he's looking away, all is good, kiss away. As soon as he catches you, you lose your points. So it's always this, this mechanic of kissing and evading. Same thing here, you've got um, folks at work working in the stable, and they have to wait till the boss is looking. Uh, and then look at this image very carefully. So this is uh, experiment kissing or biology kissing. So um, just to understand, the two characters in the foreground are kissing. When they kiss, the flame under that um, contraption uh, gets bigger. And then that changes the, uh, I don't know, the angle of the thing it's feeding. Um, so you might be able to see some analogy or a metaphor in that space. Uh, but this is explicitly designed into the game. Some of these are a little more subtle than others. Uh, same with evade, of course. You don't want your coworker to catch you kissing. Uh, and then there's some like group kiss here. And then I love doing this, and some of you may have seen this presentation or some version of it before, but I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine what a flirting game looks like now that you've seen all these kissing games. Got a nice clear image? Did it look like this? <laughs> 
So this is a very popular game in this space. There's um, two or three derivations of it. Some of them happen in, uh, this is the original Japanese version, uh, the school flirting game. And essentially, it works like tag, uh, or like a shooting game. And what happens is you flirt with this guy with this evil stare that zaps him. And then you collect all the victims of your flirting in the back. So all those folks in the back are all in love with her because she's so flirt, she's flirted so well. And um, it's actually, it's sort of like one of the more fun games in this space. All right, now I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine a sex game. Got it? I'm not gonna show it to you. <laughs> but at least you have that image in your head. Uh, although I will give you a, a quick snapshot of one of the more, um, I think, uh, I don't know, basic of the games. Um, this one was actually on Congregate for a long time. And essentially it's about pleasing this woman. So. Uh, from the research that I did, there are more than 3.5 million installs for the top 10 kissing games alone uh, on Android. And there are more than 300 kissing games. And they look a lot like this. So this is mobile listing for princess kissing. Um, and it's a very common sort of situation. You're basically saving someone from a, uh, via a kiss. Uh, and you can see quite a few downloads. So they've got 2,800 um, reviews alone. And I was surprised if for a time, not for a very long time, this is actually one of the top 100 games on uh, Android in the role-playing category. So it's actually beating out intellectual properties that were more significant. Um, there are at least 142 specific kissing games for smartphones, and most of them, 90% of them by my estimates, are free to play, which is great because it means that people don't expect to pay for affection. Um, the other thing is that 90% uh, of the affection games uh, were actually added to the app stores since about 2012. So they're um, populating very quickly. And one of the tricks here is, uh, so this is just a growth chart, so uh, there were essentially one affection game back in 2012 that was in the top 10 charts, uh, and then they sort of climbed to about 11 uh, by 2014, so 11 titles were actually in top 10 charts. People were. What I think this indicates is partly just a hunger for that play in the mobile space. And <clears throat> as many as 300 of these games actually existed on Google Play when they were there, but they're often removed quickly, which is something I have to admit as part of the research. Many of the games you see on um, Google Play are actually ripped from Flash websites or other people, uh, and then just offered with slight changes in them. So uh, a lot of cloning goes on, really cheap cloning. So, any guess who the biggest affection game celebrity is? <laughs> no, they do not have any games featuring me, thank God. <laughs> Don't make one. <laughs> uh, Justin Bieber. So, at one point, there are actually more than 10 Justin Bieber games on Google Play. And I will tell you right now, I don't think any of these are licensed. Um, it's more about that sort of that, that dream of having uh, the opportunity to kiss Justin Bieber for this particular demographic. Uh, and they're funny, like Kiss the Beeb is, you know, starts with a frog, um, and then Kiss Justin Bieber, blah, blah, blah. So most of them are unlicensed, as I mentioned. Any guess on the second biggest? So um, there's a couple. <laughs> uh, Barbie is really big. Um, the One Direction was big for a while, but I guess they're no longer cool or something. Um, but this is actually one of the ones I think is most interesting, so this is One Direction Kiss. Uh, and the way this one works is it's actually got multiple issues to, to balance. So you see your goal here, he wants to get you to know, know you, but, um, but you can't get caught by the manager or your BFF uh, when kissing. But you get power-ups, lower left-hand corner, or lower right-hand corner, depending on where you are. Uh, and the idea is that you're, you know, you've got like Selena Gomez, you've got all these celebrities. Blah, blah, blah. So Barbie's the other big one, as I mentioned. Um, and that kind of indicates what part of the demographic is. Next, I'd like to move to actually understanding affection games. As I warned you, this is like a, a series of snapshots from all the various research that I've done. So um, most of the kissing games that I've found, 80% uh, of them are kiss and evade mechanics, as I mentioned before. So a lot of the kiss and evade mechanic is just about kissing and having some imposing character not want you to kiss. Uh, so in this case, this is all the same game and all they do is change environment, which is a big cue in a lot of these games. So you're kissing in the living room, you're kissing in the park, and the old lady walking by doesn't want you to be seen, and then there's a lot of classroom kissing games. So last one is classroom, the uh, teacher doesn't want to 
doesn't want you to do it. But you can also kiss on a boat or a ferry, uh, and you have kitchen kissing, which we're going to get back to. Uh, this is a really interesting piece of misogyny. Uh, and then their kissing testers are another 15% of the, of the market. So summer kissing test is probably the most popular in its day. Uh, short version is these are basically like the love testers uh, of the last century. Uh, what happens is you press your lips to the phone and then it tells you how much passion, romance, and experience you have. Um, but these are no different than mood rings or other novelty gifts. There's no science behind this. There's nothing other than, ah, 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 I'm such a good kisser. But I imagine seeing you know, someone download this in a playground or whatever and all of a sudden everybody else wants one the way mood rings work. And there's a variety of these, kissing tests, blah, blah, blah. And the other thing I often have to do at this point is talk about sex. So in short, it's generally forbidden on both app stores. Uh, you can find lots of um, sexual play, uh, sexual affection play uh, on the web. And it's explicitly not allowed uh, on the uh, Apple App Store. However, it gets through. So this is King of Sex that was on Android for a while on Google Play. Uh, you can kind of figure out how it works. Uh, pretty basic. And you'll also find interesting content inserted that the, um, so this is actually on iOS, that the iOS folks don't even catch. So in this case, you're supposed to shake the bust to see a bust animation, and a lot of what you're doing is rubbing her hair to please her, all this other stuff, but it's part of a game that is largely kind of like a gambling game, and these are the inserts between the gambling sessions. So um, it does exist. And then uh, as part of my research, I, I kind of think of myself as a traditional researcher and then as sort of an artist, I actually made this game called Bikini Beach Zombie Massacre, which ended up in the top 100 action games in South Korea. And I'll give you some context on this crazy thing. So essentially, I was sick of the conflation of violence and sexual content. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd make a game that explicitly did that and see how much I could push the limits of publication um, without actually getting delisted. And so this game has um, every 60th frame, uh, it has nude images, uh, but there are 3D nudes like these characters. Uh, and you only see them when you reload your gun. And when you reload your gun in this game, uh, it's a top-down shooter, you actually shake your device back and forth several times. Uh, and so it has all of this innuendo in it, uh, and it got delisted after two years on uh, Google Play, and I think it's still available on iOS. But it was really just about trying to skirt these issues uh, to see how much they were allowing an output of it. So there are also sex guides, which actually are not illegal. They're kind of almost offered as books uh, in this space. Uh, and there's some things that actually facilitate um, outside uh, experience. So the idea is that you use the guide in order to do whatever you do at home. So the next question is often, who makes these games? Uh, all kinds of people. So uh, originally, most of these games were offered in what you sort of call the girls' game space. So these are websites that were targeting 12 to 16-year-old girls uh, and they had a lot of, this is where you find the dress-up games, the um, makeover games, and you find a lot of affection games. So <clears throat> these include uh, independent developers who kind of made their space originally in, um, in these girl game spaces. So girl games 1, 2, 3, girl games only, um, which did princess kissing, and actually had princess kissing pirated onto Google Play multiple times, uh, which really stinks for the developer. Um, and then ExxonMobil, which is a Brazilian company, it's Exati. I've also done a pretty good job there. So I want to come back to this and highlight some of the stats here. So uh, I've been, I'll be honest with you, as a researcher, a little reluctant to talk too much about the sexual content stuff because it's a really tricky space to understand. Um, the kissing, hugging, and flirting is a little easier. But one of the things you'll notice is where, for example, sex is popular, Newgrounds, where they allow far more content than any other space, uh, and where things like uh, flirting happen more. And one of the things I've noticed, so that's game, gamesforgirlsclub.com. One of the things I've noticed is a lot of the um, dichotomy about what is sort of appropriate play and also what is play that is um, useful to us in our practice and experimentation um, is gender divided, at least in its marketing. So you'll see that Newgrounds, uh, if you look at the earlier publication I, I provided, essentially Newgrounds has a slightly uh, stronger male population, more males are at Newgrounds than definitely than Games for Girls Club. And you actually see that the flirting games are popular in Games for Girls Club, while the sex games are relatively popular on new grounds. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is, of course, just the distribution of these games. 
So if you're an iOS owner, you actually have far less access to affection games. So your iPhone is not letting you have as much affection as your Android device. Uh, and part of that is just because of the automated review versus iOS review, which um, tends to look for slightly higher caliber. And as I mentioned earlier, the other trick is that Android has a lot of pirated content that's just dumped out as APKs for uh, players, but it's often lifted from a variety of websites or um, just relabeled. So the other interesting thing is you've got to remember that Google Play and Apple um, iOS are not the only distribution platforms. Uh, so there are a lot of these games that are actually moved off into the Chinese market, so Tencent and all these other folks actually um, have quite a few affection games as well. Also interesting that they're only typically about two minutes per level. So these are quick little games, very casual, very simple. Um, and they tend to look like this, right? So we've seen these. Uh, risk and danger is also often interesting to people. So this is bike kissing, you don't want the person in what looks sort of like a Ferrari to catch you um, while you're on the back of a bike. And then you have things like crazy car kissing, which I'll get back to as well. And all those games are gone. So they were on, they're off. So a couple weeks later, either someone says, hey, wait a minute, that's my intellectual property, what's it doing on Google Play? Uh, or they're removed for their content. Next question is often, okay, now I know who makes them, who plays them. So uh, historically, if I looked at all the, the web data traffic um, and the demographics that we could get from it, essentially it was 73% uh, identifying as female. By historically, I mean back in 2012, 2014. Uh, now uh, it's it's safe to say it's up at, like it's more it's moving more towards a 50-50. Uh, last time I looked, it was about 65%, and that I think has a lot to do with the fact that the app stores themselves don't have a gendered space. So they're like the sort of the new Harrods child store, our new Harrods toy store, and that male and female play while the toys are actually integrated. So if you go to Google Play, it's not like they say, this is the girls section, this is the boys section. So I think what they're, what's, what's happening is the affection games are actually getting played by a wider um, mix, gender mix. And then basically we're looking at 11 to 16 year olds with a few exceptions. The sex games actually tend to be a little older. Uh, so you're looking at more uh, 22, uh, 20 to about 26. And then the other thing that's really interesting is people either love or hate these games. There is very little middle ground. So um, if you look at these reviews, for example, you really get a sense for, oh, I thought this was awesome or this was awful. And it's kind of fun if you have the time, go take a look at the, um, the review comments. There are some people who use this as a prep for actually kissing or flirting. And this is their practice ground. Uh, so people will say, I, I, I tried this out before kissing my first girlfriend or boyfriend and this was handy. All right, um, other things that I, I just want to highlight real quickly are design patterns. So brand and celebrity usage and really misuse. I don't know a celebrity who said, Kim Kardashian has said, please could you make a kissing game about me? Um, instead, people just make these games and sell their identity. So uh, there's a Kiss Edward Cullen game, there's a Kiss Harry Styles game. Uh, and then the other one, both of these games are also gone now. Um, the other one is uh, princesses, mermaids, and cuddly animals are also very popular. So Harley fits into the demographic. Uh, so there's lots of games like Kitty Kiss, uh, anthropomorphized versions of males and females. And again, same situation, don't let the dog see you, don't let the cat in the back see you, um, and then you can continue to kiss like anybody cares that two cats are kissing. <laughs> uh, there are games like Kiss a Panda. Uh, and what I love about this is look at the, the only description it has. Pandas are the cutest, most adorable animals in the world. If you ever want to kiss a panda, this app is for you. End of story, right? This game is also gone at this point. But um, Or Hug a Pug. Now, read this one a little more carefully because I was excited at first. I was like, oh great, here's a hugging game. Because uh, hugging games are by far very rare. Uh, try to find three spots and rub the sweet doggy as fast as you can. Just process that and understand what that may mean. Um, all right, and then there's some that actually, I think there's some tension here, there's a cultural tension. Uh, so you've got like kids kissing, kissing game, uh, kissing angels, and you've got fun kids, for, fun kids apple kiss, which is kind of a strange translation. Um, but you've got all these kissing games, and if you do sort of quick, you know, this is just simple research, but if you look at kissing games, they're sort of free for boys and girls, in the bed, free for boys and girls, in the bed for adults. <laughs> And then free, <laughs> so the popular searches. 
Uh, one theme in terms of a design pattern is you do see a lot of risk and danger. So back to bike kissing, the idea is you don't want to get an accident on the back of this bike, but it's fun because you're on the back of a bike kissing. Um, or clinic kissing, essentially you have to kiss, but make sure the orderly doesn't catch you. And I want you to note that second panel really carefully. It's like, so she's praise, good girl praying, and then when the orderly's gone, oh yeah, let's get the kissing on, right? Um, which has a lot of um, connotation itself. Uh, turns out that if you are caught by the thugs, you can kiss as a ghost, um, which also has a theme. Uh, and then there's kissing wrestlers, which I didn't know anything about, but I gave this, um, this talk, and it turns out this actually happened in the WWF. Uh, so in short, you're basically kissing the woman on the right, and the boyfriend is being interviewed, and he's pissed. So you've got to sneak your kisses in while the boyfriend's being interviewed, and make sure he doesn't catch you. Um, there's also some poly affection. So I think this is a really interesting example. It's a rather newer game in the space. Uh, so the word, way give me a kiss works is you're trying to attract this woman based on these uh, five, four characters. So you've got a top-down view, and she's in the middle. You tap to start, and then multiple players are trying to attract her in order to get the kiss, or give the kiss. Um, one of the things that is really interesting here, if you think about it by metaphor, it's not a great metaphor. She's basically like a hockey puck in this scenario, um, which is absolutely awful. Uh, but the idea is these guys are kind of gentleman callers, but what they're doing is they're sort of like calling out. So you've got, um, there's some cliches here. There's the Frenchman, and, the, um, and he's sort of like, wee, 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 wee. All right, uh, so non-consensual affection should really be assault games, um, and there are a lot of them, or misogyny games, and I'm just gonna call them icky games for now. I can't talk about the space without talking about the fact that they are there. So here's your first icky game. So the way this game works is, um, the description is really quite useful here. Uh, basically, these two folks really love Selena and wanna kiss her. One of the levels, the first level, uh, you have to kiss her while she's sleeping and try not to wake her up. Uh, the second one, paying attention to the road, that interest in danger. And the last level, um, she has to kiss uh, the other one, et cetera. And one of the things that is interesting is this, don't, uh, you have to kiss her without waking her up. I'm not exactly sure that's consensual. Then you have uh, games like Dead Drunk Lover, where you're actually um, basically trying to carry this drunk person into, um, into her bed. Uh, and then kiss and run, which is basically like a tag game. So you're running, and then you just kiss whomever. Uh, so all in this sort of icky game category. And then there's lots, uh, particularly on the sex side, lots of conflating sex and violence. Um, so even this game, which came from an Indian developer, you can see what happens is almost sort of um, more gratuitous bust when the accident occurs than um, when you successfully kiss. So um, there's sort of an expected payout there. There's also lots of stuff in gender rules. Uh, so as I mentioned, you anthropomorphize two specific gender roles. There's a red, or a red unicorn and a blue unicorn, so we know who's who. Um, and they tend to be of the same race and creature type. This is not just for the Japanese-made games, it's also for the American-made games and um, the general audience in South America as well. So kitties kiss kitties, uh, you know, anime characters kiss anime characters, etc. cetera. Uh, same gender affection is very rare in this space. Uh, all affection, so non-sexual, sexual, same gender is still rare. Uh, and to that point, I actually made this game called Stolen Kisses for uh, Android. And the way this game works is essentially you've got about six characters, it's been a while since I made it, that you can choose from that are ethnically and gender diverse. And the idea is you get to kiss them and you have to manage the, um, the quality of your kiss. So each one wants a different kind of kiss. Uh, and you can go ahead and press your lips to the, um, to the screen and, and give them a different kiss. And just as a side note, to help you understand how iOS works, uh, I love this little bit of story. So I, this game had been an Android, it does fine. It's, it's free, it doesn't really make me any money. But I try to release it on iOS, and I've never really had an app rejected by iOS. Uh, after three rejections, they actually called me, Apple called me to have a conversation about this, because they were like, we've been fine with everything else, what's going on here? I gave them the gist of the game, and they said no, flat out no. And the reason they said no is because, um, I have the statement I posted on Twitter, you can't offer that kind of play because kissing your phone might break it because it promotes uh, applying liquid to your game, to your device. So that was their way of preventing this kind of kissing game. But ultimately, I think they don't like the politics, they don't like the experience. All right, so um, gender roles. Let's look at kitchen kissing again. The way kitchen kissing works is that this woman has to tend to all of the needs in this kitchen while her beau comes in for his kiss. 
So the water overflows, you gotta mix the cake, the kids need to be played with, etc. And then this guy is like, hey, now where's my kiss? So um, lots of interesting things going there. And then uh, this is part of the flirting game, so this is their, their sort of next version of flirting game. And in this, you do not want the dorky guy or the punk rocker because they kill your stamina. So they're actually like detriments to your performance. You only want the good looking cool dude. The other interesting, so there's the good looking cool dude. The other interesting thing about it is that um, you have competitive flirting in this. So two players can actually balance each other, um, or uh, a non-player character is competing with a player character for the attention of these flirts, or these people who have been flirted with. And then there's the strange. So um, this is a mermaid kissing game. Uh, and the way the mermaid kissing game works is essentially, if you can, if you can decipher this, Hallie Henley and loved very much, but one day Hallie was trying to leave a land of mermaids and was caught by the boss. So these are highlights from a very long narrative. First, you have to guide your boss towards Hallie. Later, you remove all the head weapons. Then you must solve a puzzle and get a maze. Um, when, then the two will kiss, and you should alert them when someone is looking at them. So there's kiss and evade in here with a whole lot of other stuff. So this thing really tried hard. Um, and I like that the instructions are use your fingers to play. <laughs> so, I think this is the first MMMAGF, um, so remember that acronym, it may become really big. Uh, it's a mermaid, a maze, mermaid, merman affection game fighter, because that's what happens in it. You have a little bit of fighting, you have a little maze, you have a little affection, um, so there's your first MMMAGF. Uh, and this one has blood cheers. <laughs> uh, this wasn't a particularly popular game, but it, there's a lot of production that went into this, so I'm, I'm curious about it. All right, so a few parting notes, so we can leave time for questions. So I love that Google doesn't actually think that these exist. So if you look up affection games, it goes, do you mean affection games? <laughs> um, and it still does that. Like this, I took a screenshot years ago, and it's still sort of like, nah, I don't think you mean that. Uh, and then I like, when I teach this kind of stuff, as part of uh, a course I teach called Games and Society, one of the things that I do is I try to tell people understand what's novel about this intersection. So if you look at the analog affection games that we first started talking about at the very beginning of this lecture, uh, essentially what happens is you've got a, um, a locus of play that is either the sort of two people or the group play, and it's all within that space. When we switch to digitally mediated or object mediated play, like the Kiss Controller or Big Huggin, we've got two things going on. We can either, uh, in a mobile game, just offer our affection to the device, which says a lot about our relationship to the device. Or we can actually offer it through the device. So there are even people, um, you may have heard the old term like teledodonics or whatever, there are all these people who are interested in trying to um, offer affection across the wires. Uh, but the idea that I think is most interesting is that we have no sense for what that game object is. If you were trying to create an object that helped communicate or um, send a flirt, like I don't even understand conceptually how you would offer that object. Some of the other objects are a little more easy to um, come up with metaphors for. So that's all I've got. Um, thank you. Six minutes for questions if anyone has any. Yes? Oh, no, that was young. Or is that a question? That's a question. Great. So uh, I noticed that almost all of these games conceptualize affection Physical way. Yep. Uh, do you, did you encounter it? Can you uh, talk about games that would conceptualize it in a verbal? So I think this is where I um, I drew a line. I guess you could say I drew a line in the sand. If you look at um, uh, dating sims, the dating sims have a bit of this sort of like I'm going to win your affection or I'm going to win your favor by doing things or saying the right thing for you. And um, there's a sort of charming. I don't know how I describe the book, I wouldn't call it an academic book, around sort of like love languages that explicitly talks about how some people express love through purchasing items for others or, or um, doing favors, doing acts of service for others. Uh, what's interesting is that I haven't seen anything that I would consider a traditional affection game, but certainly dating sims do that. And the, the reason I draw the line is that I feel like the payout versus the game goal is different between a, a, a dating sim and an affection game. An affection game, there's very little sort of like, hey, would you like to date? It's like, all right, it's kissing time, let's go. And they have almost a, a, a trading component to them. Uh, and it's very operationalized. Uh, so there's one called Kiss Chemistry that actually is about the proper mix of emotion, passion, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you're just mixing the chemistry to get the kiss. 
where the digital effects, I'm sorry, the um, dating sims tend to be about relationship building. They're uh, they're built on models of relationships, and so the the goal is different. But I think those tend to bias more towards communicate your affection. Yeah, demonstrate your affection. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking if my phone told me that it loved me, yep. I just wouldn't care. Yeah. I, I, I think, so this is the other thing I think is fascinating. So uh, uh, my earlier practice was in critical gameplay, and in critical gameplay I was really interested in how we, um, uh, it's, it's an extension of something called critical design, uh, Dunn Raby, uh, Royal College of Art now, I think at RISD. Uh, short version is we, are, we need to be critical of our relationship to the industrial product we use on a daily basis and how much we feel about them, right? Like some people love their cars, or love their phones. Uh, and I think that's partly cultural. So in other cultures, there's actually more of a sort of like, yes, this object has its own sort of spirit, and I appreciate that spirit. Uh, in the USA, we bias against that, but ultimately, we still offer affection to it. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Have you uh, explored much with virtual reality version games and are working on? I haven't seen much, which is interesting, because I think part of the original lore was like, I could have a whole realistic relationship via VR, um, but I haven't seen much in that space. I don't know. <laughs> I, it's, I think the, the challenge is you need something haptic, right? And so you saw the KISS controller, it needs, yeah. I don't know if I want to go down that road yet. <laughs> Other questions? All right, thank you.